Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore the phenomenon of apports. With me is Professor Stanley Krippner, who is the Alan Watts Professor of Psychology at Saybrook University. He is a distinguished parapsychologist who has won many, many lifetime achievement awards from different organizations, has been president of numerous academic bodies, and is the editor of a series of important books in parapsychology called Advances in Parapsychology. The the co-author of the classic work Dream Telepathy and the author of over a thousand academic papers. Welcome, Stan. Thank you for your glorious introduction, Jeff. It is well deserved. You've been an inspiration to generations of students, including myself. Um, but today I want to talk about a very important study you did in Brazil with an individual who seemed to have the almost unbelievable ability to produce apports. So let's, let's talk about what an apport is and how you managed to research this. Sure. Years ago, I was in the Philippines giving a seminar and I was taken to an apport museum. Now, the Philippines is one of those countries in the world where there are all sorts of alleged psychic phenomena. Mm -hmm. Uh, the so-called psychic surgery, which I had a chance to witness, not convinced that it was actual surgery, but at least people were feeling better after the yeah. intervention. Also, many, many mediums exist in the Philippines. Jaime Luciano is a psychic investigator in the Philippines, and he took me to a little museum, which I think is in somebody's home, and there is a under glass collection of coins and figurines that supposedly dropped out of nowhere. So this was my introduction to the world of apports. Mm -hmm. Later I found out that these were very common among English mediums at the turn of the century, not so common in this day and age, but occasionally they are reported. Well, you probably also know that the Stanford University Museum has a collection of apported objects. Yes, they keep it under cover, but they have yeah. a collection, right, uh -huh. right. The University of Manitoba in Canada now has a new museum, and they have uh, all of my apports that mm -hmm. you'll be hearing about. But and now by apports, you mean the objects? The that, actual object, yes, mm -hmm. the actual that object. appeared out of nowhere. Yes, that's right, that's right. As if they drop out of the ceiling or out or of thin air. Or they started out in one place and they end up in another place. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, some 20 years ago, I was leading a group to Brazil introducing them to mediums, healers, other unusual people. And I've been to Brazil probably three dozen times over the years, so I know these people very well. Mm -hmm. And we went to the City of Peace, which is in Brasilia, and it's the home of the International Holistic University. Pierre Weil at that time was the rector of the university. And he said that he had just met an unusual medium who he wanted to invite to dinner. And his name was Amir Ahmadin. Mm -hmm. And his background is Islamic, and his parents came from the Middle East. And Pierre said that he wanted to talk to me about these unusual manifestations in his life. Well, before he had a chance to talk, um, we were at dinner, and he likes beautiful women, so I put a beautiful woman on each side of him. You're talking about Amir now. I'm talking about Amir. Pierre also liked beautiful <laughs> women, by the way. So there was another beautiful woman by him. Yeah. And of course, Brazil is filled with beautiful women, one of the many, many wonderful things about that country. Mm -hmm. So Amir asked one of them, what is it that you have not yet found in Brazil? And she said, oh, you know, I've been looking for an emerald. I have not found an emerald. He said, close your hand. 
I didn't see this. This comes from her testimony. And he put his hand over her hand. He said, open your hand. She opened her hand. There was an emerald. So while she was recovering from the surprise, he said to another woman, and what are you looking for? Oh, I'd like a gold bracelet. So he took the tin foil from the little pads of butter and arranged them into a circular form, put them around her wrist, and right before her eyes, they told him to turn it into a gold bracelet. Mm -hmm. Well, after dinner, he told us all the story about how his family has been distinguished by experiences like this, and he recently has had experiences himself. He works for an import-expert company, or did at the time, and he also has a part-time job as secretary of a labor union, mm -hmm. and so he didn't have much time for an indulgence in these matters. Also, his family yeah. was very much against it. He was not a professional entertainer. He was not a professional entertainer at all, no. no. Or even an amateur entertainer, I Afraid presume. not, no. And so, Be because the first thing anybody would think is this is a magic trick. Of course, whenever I encounter a psychic claimant or a claimant medium having a background of magic, this goes through my mind, I think, how could a magician perform these feats? Mm -hmm. And so this is a deliberation I bring with me whenever I'm investigating what we call spontaneous cases. And in many, many cases, I can figure out how a magician would perform those treat, those, those effects, yeah. and this immediately puts the effect into some type of suspicion for me. Mm -hmm. So as he was talking, a uh, number of people were very skeptical, others were very, very open, but then on a walk to dinner, bright colored stones kept falling out of nowhere at people's feet. And people were delighted, and they got to keep them. Now, it's hard to figure out how a bright colored stone could fall out of nowhere unless he was tossing them up in the air, which of course he didn't, we could watch them. And then a number of other things happened spontaneously. Um, blood appearing in a chalice, or at least something that looks like blood appearing in a chalice, strange markings on people's doors, etc. And so the people left Brasilia with all sorts of experience. I said, now you must write them up. Because again, my scientific bias is to record something unusual, not just to use it as conversation, but to write it up. Mm -hmm. And then I said to Pierre Weil, well, when can I come back and do some investigation? So almost a year later, things fell into line so that I could come back with a college student who, by the way, was very skeptical. I thought it would be very important to have a skeptic along on the trip. Mm -hmm. So all of this, by the way, has been published in a series of seven or eight articles. But over the course of a week, we recorded some 98 anomalous phenomena, and I had the student, myself, and Pierre Weil rate them on a little scale that I had designed, ranging from not anomalous at all, not puzzling at all, to very anomalous, uh, one to five scale, as I recall. And so the ones that were not anomalous at all were dropped, but only four of them were dropped. Mm -hmm. The others had some degree of punishment, puzzlement with them. Now, just Close to 90. Pardon me? 90 different Yeah, some 90 e different events. strange occurrences. Mm -hmm. The student was off in a field with a magnetometer measuring the geomagnetic fields of the area. Every two minutes he would make another recording. Oh. And then when the battery gave out, he would come back and join us. So he had a chance both to record data and to observe data. Of course, he didn't know what was happening with his recordings. What he saw a person, he was very skeptical about. He thought this must be a magic trick, even though he couldn't explain it. But to my way of thinking, it was important to have a skeptic along. Yes. And it sort of belies the presumption, if there's a skeptic along, nothing anomalous will happen. 
Well, that might be true in some cases, never has happened to me. Mm -hmm. Let me just give you an example of some of the airports that fell out of nowhere. There was a Brazilian senator who came with his wife, and he had told his wife about Amir, and he said, could Amir produce something? And Amir said, oh, it depends upon the spirits, but I think the spirits like her. And then, plunk, a ring came out of nowhere, fell on the floor, it fit her exactly, and so she was very happy. She now had a souvenir from the spirit world, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yeah. Also, Roberto Crema, who was a psychologist on our team, said to Amir, my daughter's having her 12th birthday, and she's looking forward f for a gift. Well, he said, it depends on the spirits. I can't do this myself. Plunk, out of nowhere on the floor came a little ring with 12 rhinestones in it, and it fit his daughter perfectly, mm -hmm. he told us the next day. Mm -hmm. The most common object was colored stones. These are what we call milled stones. You take ordinary stones, you run them through a mill, and they come out looking like semi-precious stones. Mm -hmm. Yes, several dozens of these appear. If they landed in front of a person, that person got to keep them. More interesting were the religious medallions, which go back maybe a hundred years with Latin inscriptions on them. Fortunately, I was able to photograph these because later those were stolen from my apartment, which mm. is a sad story. That's why when I bet back the second and the third time, all of those airports got shipped to the museum in Canada so they wouldn't get stolen. But it was interesting that the design on the religious medallion had some connection to the person whose feet it landed on. Mm -hmm. Pierre Weil sort of focused on the ones that seemed to be written in Latin because he had a uh, background and knowledge of Latin and he was originally from Europe. And the um, medallions that fell to me were more generic in nature in terms of showing um, Jesus Christ with a lamb, symbology of the lamb, uh, Jesus sacrificing himself mm -hmm. for the benefit of humankind. And even though Amir was raised Muslim and not Christian, all of the medallions had some connection with Christianity. And another very unusual thing that happened was that from time to time he would say, I think something's going to happen. And then immediately Ruth Colson, the physician on our team, would take his pulse, take his uh, pH reading because he said he had acid feelings in his mouth when something was going to happen. And then plunk, something happened. And then she would immediately again take blood pressure, pulse, and acid reading. Now, when we did the statistics, the acid reading was high, higher than a average, didn't reach statistical significance, but he was still right when he said there was an acid feeling. The um, pulse and the heart rhythm, that again was very irregular mm -hmm. before and after the apport took place against a baseline reading. So it's a good thing we had this physiological data. Mm -hmm. Perhaps one of the things that I wrote up which deserved a separate article was the stigmata. And when you, you mentioned he was Muslim, yes, but he showed uh, he would airport Christian uh, medallions, yes. and now you're telling me he uh, has produced evidence of stigmata. Stigmata, which goes back to St. Francis of Assisi. Uh -huh. of Assisi. Mm -hmm. He's the first recorded case of Christian stigmata. After viewing some pictures of Jesus Christ, uh, he would break out in blood on his hands and on his forehead. Mm -hmm. And over the years, there have been a few dozen of these, not only Catholic, but Protestants. Mm -hmm. Some of them are complete fakes, yeah. and they've been recorded as fakes. Others have been investigated by doctors. Now, frankly, I did not think this was anomalous, mm -hmm. because we know that psychosomatically, somebody can create bruises on their skin 
with intense concentration, usually mm -hmm. unconscious. Or hypnosis. Or hypnosis can produce this, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that got a low rating on the anomaly scale for me. The yeah. other two people ranked it very high. Mm -hmm. But like I say, that all has been written up in a separate yeah. article because it deserves special attention. Also, my whole theory of stigmata, mm -hmm. which is really on record, people can read that if they're interested. Well, let me go back to the apported objects. Now, yes. you mentioned the, the inexpensive polished stones and the, and the medallions, I presume, are inexpensive. But as I recall, the emerald that materialized in the hand of the woman you were at dinner with, that was uh, examined by a jeweler and was yes. determined to be an authentic emerald. It was an authentic emerald, a low-grade emerald, but an authentic emerald. The gold bracelet, low-carat gold, but it was authentic gold, yes. Mm -hmm. And there was a little diamond that appeared in a tear drop while we were in Pierre Weil's office, and that was an authentic diamond. Very small, but it was authentic. A jeweler got the number of carats in the diamond. And so all of that, all of these things are evaluated by jewelers. I suppose the most unusual apport happened when I was saying, you know, in parapsychology, the holy grail is linked rings. Yes. Two metal rings that have not been soldered together that appear out of no place. Amir said, I think something's going to happen. And we did the measurements, and plunk, out of nowhere came a metallic ring linked to another metallic mm -hmm. ring. This fell at the feet of Harbans Lalaurora, a physicist from a Brazilian university. He took it back to his university, no sign of soldering, and he put this in a safe, and that's where it is to this day in Fortaleza, Brazil. Anybody who wants to investigate it can go in Fortaleza, that's where it is. I'm so glad I didn't take it back or it had been stolen like the other apples. Mm. So, But that's what you would call uh, a permanent paranormal object. Yes, a permanent paranormal object, right. That's a catchphrase in parapsychology, a PPE, and I saw one because it's permanent, it's still there. Some airports come and go, they disappear, they reappear. Mm -hmm. So once we got back home, I did the statistics, and we had a degree of anomaly for each of these events. Those correlated significantly, interestingly enough, with the geomagnetic field. Mm -hmm. The higher the geomagnetic level, the more anomalous the experience. Oh. Just the opposite of what we found in our dream telepathy mm -hmm. experiments, and that was the lower the geomagnetic field, the more likely the uh, telelepathy was to of occur. Of course, apports are very different from very different. telepathy or clairvoyance. What we call extrasensory perception and psychokinesis, or more currently what we call anomalous perception and anomalous perturbation. Mm -hmm. But whatever you want to call it, those are, I think, two different kettles of fish. Yeah. And have maybe different ambient environmental correlates. Mm -hmm. So this is the first time that uh, these airports, as far as I know, have actually been linked to events in the body of the uh, claimant medium mm -hmm. or the uh, ambient environment. Mm -hmm. Amir, of course, has wonderful stories to tell. He claims that when he dreams, he goes to a parallel universe, and in that parallel universe, he has a daughter, and he has another life. People are more accepting of him there. And so we got stuff published, and Amir was a little bit unhappy because the name of the publication was Apparent Anomalous experience. Yeah. It's not appearance. You saw this yourself. And Amir, this is just what you have to do in parapsychology. Mm -hmm. You have to be very cautious in introducing these terms. But you read the article. I don't think that there's been any allegation that you might have been fraudulent. So he said, I'm going to ask the spirits to demonstrate this for you. And so when I was in another room making a phone call, plunk! There was another apport. This time it was a fairly large stone, jade-colored. 
and as big as my fist. I brought it back in and Pierre said, that's the same color as a book that has disappeared. He went to his bookcase, the book had reappeared. Oh. Yeah, same color. Mm -hmm. That happened when I was in a different room and Amir mm -hmm. had no idea I was going to go into that different room. Mm -hmm. There were several other uh, things that happened at ports during that experience. This time I took no chances. I sent them off to Canada. And then just recently I was in Brazil and Amir, I should say Amir has now reached tired from his jobs. He wants to take his gift and use it for healing people. Mm. He's gone to a part of Brazil where there are a few lepers, and he has helped the lepers supposedly retain their health. Mm -hmm. And so he's using these gifts for the benefit of uh, humankind. Mm -hmm. So that's now his mission. But he came to visit me, and I said, Amir, I want to take your picture. Do you mind? As soon as that flash bulb went off, plunk, an airport came out of no place. And this is maybe 20 years after your original yes. research. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. This was a beautiful medallion of Joan of Arc, freshly minted. Hmm. This was important because Pierre Weil had passed a few years before, and he was from France. So it's like Pierre was with us and giving his mm -hmm. acknowledgement. Yeah. And then I said, now I want a picture of the two of us together. So Roberto Crema, who had taken Pierre's place as rector of the university, took our picture with a flash camera. And again, plunk! And this time it was one of those beautiful stones. That wasn't the end of it. As we had our conversation, there was this very, very sweet smell. This characterized my other work with Amir. Little pools of perfume would appear. And this time I said, Amir, this time I'm going to soak up the perfume and take it back with mm -hmm. me. Sometimes apports are in the form of liquid, not solids. Yeah. I took it back with me. I had a perfumery expert sniff it. This is a perfume that was used in Europe at the turn of the century. You cannot really match this with any perfume easily found in the United States. Mm. It was sort of a sweet, musky smell, and so... I sent the little tissues with the smell on it off to Canada as well. And to a university there. Yes, to the university. So all of those are now in the museum at the University of Manitoba, all of the remaining okay. apports that I mm -hmm. have. Well, I think it's fair to say that even amongst professional parapsychologists, phenomenon of this magnitude are not only rare, but even frightening, that most parapsychologists are, are intimidated by what, what we might call macro PK. Well, look what happened to the PK man. How many parapsychologists, aside from myself, ever talk about your work with the PK man? Very, very few. few. Stephen yeah. Browdy being one, yeah, one of Stephen the exceptions. Yeah, Stephen was very broad-minded, and he's been on your show many times. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. But for the most part, uh, even amongst parapsychologists, they're likely to think that, you, you know, old Stan Krippner's gone a little daffy here. Uh, they, they've been saying that for years. In fact, I have to say that sometimes I get along better with the critics, mm -hmm. like Ray Hyman, than I do with some of my fellow parapsychologists who think that I've gone over the edge talking about the airports. I can understand that because parapsychologists are tr struggling for respectability and these kinds of phenomena are not respectable. I know. Thank heavens I've been working at Saybrook University for the last 40 years. Saybrook is a little unknown university, mm -hmm. fully accredited but still unknown. However, these phenomena are widely discussed, widely accepted, dissertations on the topics, master's theses on the topic, mm -hmm. no problem in my uh, university with being up front and out of the closet with airports and other forms of uh, uh, paranormal phenomena. Mm -hmm. And of course, to be fair, uh, there are many other well-documented cases of airports. There are many others, yes. Although I, you probably the most extensive on record are, are the studies you did with Amir. That's right. Mm -hmm. And especially the fact that with Amir we had 
correlates, not only psychophysiological correlates, but geomagnetic correlates. And I don't think anybody mm -hmm. else has ever done this. I hope people do in the future. Yeah. How, however, to my understanding, you didn't actually capture on film or video the actual moment when the apport appeared. We tried to. This is another story. We had videos going all the time of all of the sessions. And in Brazil, they developed the video a white line on a black background consistently. That itself is anomalous. Mm -hmm. None of the effects ever were successfully videotaped, which is a shame, but you can't predict what's going to happen during these phenomena. That was a real shame. We thought, now we have everything recorded. No, we didn't. We tried. We set up the video camera, got everything developed, white on black. Well, that, that in itself it. might be a uh, paranormal effect. That might be a permanent paranormal effect because it happened consistently, right, right? Right. I should mention that that's not the end of the airports. For the past several years, I've been corresponding with a Native American shaman by the name of Fawn Journeyhawk. And the first time I saw her, she produced these airports, beautiful little stones, not like the milled stones, mm -hmm but in geometric shapes that appear out of nowhere. And she has used these in her healings. Mm -hmm. I've sent many people to her for healings. Recently, she sent me a whole Native American pouch with perhaps two dozen stones in it. Mm -hmm. And I said, Fawn, this is such a treasure that I want to send some to this museum in Canada and she said, that's fine, but you have to send the whole family. They're a family. I see. So I sent them to Canada, and I said, now look, you've got to keep counting these stones, photograph them, because from time to time they change shapes, and some of them appear, some of them disappear. So they're doing that. They're doing that mm. right now. I sent somebody to Fawn for a healing, and she came back with uh, not only some stones, but a whole history of objects that were precious to her disappearing and the reappearing in a different place a few days later. So I'm very fortunate in the fact that I've had three experiences at ports, one vicariously in the Philippines, another one vicariously with uh, the woman who went to Fawn Verniehawk, Journeyhawk, and one over the course of a week I actually saw in person with a mirror now again, I know some of your listeners are going to throw up their hands in despair and think, those two guys are off the wall, things appearing out of nowhere, whoever heard of such a thing. Well, Pierre Weil, while he was alive, had some different models to explain airports. He said, maybe the airports are created spontaneously mm -hmm. in the spirit world by the medium, who knows, but they come out of nowhere and they're you know, pull together what's in the cosmos. Another possibility is that they're teleported from someplace else in the mm. world, mm -hmm. and they disappear in one place and appear in the other place. Right. So, at least he had the courage to come up with two different models, and then he said, of course, the third possibility is all sleight of hand, mm -hmm. and it's a magician's effect. I had one experience, which I had several experiences, very hard to explain by sleight of hand, but one in particular. On one stormy night, we were eating in the university cafeteria in Brasilia, and it was storming outside. And I said to Emir and the others, this is just the type of weather that is supposedly connected to psychokinesis oh, yes. and recurrent uh -huh. spontaneous psychokinesis. So let me go outside and see what I find. I get outside and immediately a dozen stones fall on a car and bounce off and hit the ground. Mm -hmm. So I was going around picking up these little stones and bringing them back and say, look what I found. Mm. And in the meantime, Emir had produced a ring for a young woman who was in the, uh, in the cafeteria with us. So that indeed was the time when we had more airports than any other time and it was the night when more uh, geomagnetic, geomagnetic disturbances happened than any other time. Well, Stan, we're out of time, 
speaking of time, but uh, this has been really fascinating. And I think the lesson in all of this is that these phenomena that seem unbelievable and possibly rare may be far more common than we realize. Okay. There, mm -hmm. there may be opportunities for young researchers to observe them and maybe understand them better than we are able to today. Thank you so much again for being with me, Stan. You're very welcome. And thank you for being with us. Okay.